On July 19th, 1876, seven delegates representing three socialist parties and the remnants of the Marxist First International met at a unity conference and established the Working Men's Party of the United States. A year later, this name was changed to the Socialistic Labor Party and later changed to the Socialist Labor Party. The party was largely made up of German immigrants, but had some English language support. They found some successes in its early years, playing a significant role in the 1877 railroad strike, and actually had some electoral successes in 1878, electing three candidates to the Illinois State Legislature and a city alderman in Chicago. However, this short honeymoon phase wouldn't last, as the economic crisis of 1877 caused some of the party's English language publications to go out of business, and an influx of German socialists fleeing repression from Germany came to dominate the political party. Since many of these German immigrants weren't citizens and thus couldn't vote, they had little interest in electoral politics, leading to a growing anarchist faction of the SLP to emerge. However, soon they would all end up leaving by 1884, transforming the SLP into an explicitly Marxist political party. Membership doubling from 30 sections to 60 sections by 1886, but it was unable to form statewide organizations and their attempts to re-establish English language press continually flopped. However, finally, they began to venture back into electoral politics, supporting Henry George's mayoral campaign in New York in 1886. But due to the lack of English language leaders, they were isolated from the bulk of the unions and the electorate. Finally, in 1888, they entered into presidential politics, but oddly enough, did not actually feel a candidate, but instead field a slate of independent electors in New York, winning only 2,068 votes. In 1890, the SLP finally found an English-speaking leader that they had been longing for, Daniel de Leon, an immigrant from Curaçao. De Leon quickly emerged as a national organizer and speaker of the party, and quickly took over as editor in its newly re-established English-language paper, The People. He also ran as the SLP's candidate for governor of New York in 1891, winning 1.3% of the vote. Viewing this as a success, the SLP decided that they'd nominate their first presidential candidate in 1892, nominating camera inventor Simon Wing of Massachusetts for president and electrician Charles Machette of New York for vice president. One of the interesting things of note was that one of the planks of their platform was literally abolishing the office of the presidency. They were only on the ballot in five states and ultimately only got 0.18% of the popular vote. In the immediate aftermath of the election, de Leon increasingly used his influence within the party, namely his position as editor of the party newspaper, to influence the SLP's ideology and direction. As part of this, de Leon greatly shifted the SLP's strategy away from working within existing unions like the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor, and formed the Socialist Trade and Labor Alliance, a union directly aligned with the SLP. However, their party was not fully under de Leon's intellectual control, but as we see from like pretty much every single minor party in existence, effectively the most popular individual of that party sort of becomes like their de facto dictator. Seeking to continue establishing a prominent socialist alternative to the broadly still capitalist two-party system, the SLP met on July 9th to nominate a new presidential ticket. This ticket, comprising of moving Machette at the top of the ticket, and Alderman and Secretary of the Central Labor Union, Matthew McGuire, to be his vice president. McGuire is actually interesting because he is the individual that was credited for being the first person in the U.S. to actually propose the idea of a Labor Day, even though a different McGuire of the more right-wing AFL kind of got all the credit. Their convention also saw them expand their platform to be a bit more policy heavy as opposed to philosophy heavy, calling for an eight hour workday, nationalizing mines, railroads, canals, telegraphs, and telephones, giving municipalities ownership of water, gas, and electric plants, giving the federal government the sole authority to issue money, a federal jobs guarantee, abolishing the veto power of the US Senate, establishing women's suffrage, and creating a uniform criminal law throughout the country. They were only on the ballot in 20 states and ultimately only received 0.26% of the popular vote. In the aftermath of the 1896 election, problems within the party soon began to emerge over their trade union strategy. While de Leon and his supporters favored building the Socialist Trade and Labor Alliance and viciously attacked unions like the AFL, 
Another faction within the party, led by Morris Hillquit, were critically supportive of other unions and sought to radicalize them by boring from within. They also opposed De Leon's increasing consolidation of power within the party and his dogmatic approach to politics. Then finally in 1899, the anti-Deleon faction narrowly took over the New York General Committee and attempted to take over the SLP by forming a new national executing with Henry Solabedin as the national secretary and tried to remove De Leon from his position as editor of the people. However, this wasn't recognized by the sitting national executive who sided with De Leon and dubbed the dissidents kangaroos and thus the party effectively split into two with each wing claiming to be the official socialist labor party, each publishing a newspaper called The People, and each presenting their own competing slate of candidates in the 1899 New York elections. The court soon ruled in favor of De Leon and his wing of the party, so Hillquit and his dissidents, including the previously mentioned presidential candidates Machet and Simon Wing, decided to join up with the Social Democratic Party of America, led by Eugene V. Debs and Victor Berger. The split caused the SLP a significant portion of its membership but it still managed to hold on, due in large part to De Leon's efforts. And they pretty much were like, okay, now that that's out of the way, let's move on to the presidency. They had two people who were actually interested in seeking their presidential nomination. Machinist Joseph Francis Maloney and glassblower Valentin Remmel. Maloney was nominated on the first ballot and Remmel actually got to be nominated to be his running mate. The party also decided to drop its immediate demands from the platform and instead of campaigning specifically to promote class consciousness and revolutionary socialism, they managed to get on the ballot in 22 states and ultimately won 0.29% of the votes, or roughly half what the Social Democratic Party candidate Eugene Debs won, but as you can see, socialism is a little bit on the rise, and now that there are two socialist parties on the scene, it's probably best to try and differentiate the two. De Leon decided to take complete control of the SLP, and move into an increasingly more radical direction, rejecting any sort of participation in government or reform measures, calling for a complete and swift transition to socialism. They also decided to attack the larger socialist party as opportunists, who in turn called the SLP impossibilists. De Leon also started to bring elements of syndicalism into the party ideology, establishing a new sort of ideology that he is called socialist industrial unionism, but many just call it de Leonism, which argued that socialists should organize revolutionary socialist industrial unions and a political party, specifically the Socialist Labor Party, to run in elections with the goal of being able to get a mandate at the ballot box for the socialist industrial unions to seize the means of production and then serve as the basis for government in a socialist society. Now despite the fact that they were noticeably smaller than the Socialist Party and had some financial troubles, they still managed to have some money to scrounge up a presidential campaign, that candidate being printer Charles Hunter Corrigan and interior decorator William Wesley Cox as his running mate. They were on the ballot in 19 states and ultimately received 0.25% of the popular vote. Meanwhile, the Socialist Party had managed to get into whole numbers so maybe it was time for the Socialist Labor Party to kind of start being more friendly to them. In 1905, De Leon and the SLP took part in forming the Industrial Workers of the World, a radical industrial union alongside Big Bill Haywood, anarchist Emma Goldman, and their rival Eugene V. Debs. The intent and purpose of it was for all of them to be like, I know we may disagree on this, this, and this, but we all agree that workers are good and socialism is pretty good, so why don't we all just come together and work together? I mean, as Marx once said, proletarians of all countries unite, and things were rather good at first. Debs, De Leon, and all the others were managing to get along and helping the IWW grow. But by 1908, he and the SLP broke with the IWW after they were accused for attempting to hijack it for their own political games. They in turn accused the IWW of being taken over by anarchists and the bummers, and they decided to set up their own rival union called the Workers International Industrial Union. Now I'm pretty sure that forming their own separate union with the same goals didn't prove any of the claims against him, and De Leon's constant alienation from the rest of the socialist movement 
made a lot of the members of the SLP mad to the point where at the 1908 convention, a bunch of people in the party wanted him removed from his position as editor in favor of a more moderate choice, saying that he's alienating any potential support that the SLP could have. However, this was rejected by an overwhelming majority, so they just went business as usual and tried to nominate a presidential ticket. De Leon proposed Martin Preston of Nevada, a 32-year-old IWW member who was serving a 25-year murder sentence for killing a restaurant owner who had opposed a strike, you know, despite the constitutionality of his candidacy, and they decided, alright. They also nominated Donald L. Monroe, a machinist and politician, to be his running mate. A few days after the convention, however, Preston sent a telegram declining their nomination, so as a replacement, engineer August Gilhouse was nominated in his place. They ultimately received 0.09% of the popular vote. With that poor showing even by their standards and their worsening financial situation, things were not really looking so good for the SLP going into the 1912 elections. But for their rivals, the Socialist Party, things were going really good. Socialism was way in, even electing their first member of Congress in 1910. But obviously, due to many reasons, the SLP decided to increase their attacks on the Reformist Socialist Party and also the Anarchist IWW. Their favorite target was Victor L. Berger, as he was the pure embodiment of Reformist Socialism in the United States, given the fact that he was even considered a reformist in his own party, effectively creating his own brand of socialism called Sewer Socialism, which was technically helping the Socialist Party in this current election. In an effort to be the revolution to the Socialist Party's reform, they decided to nominate an opposing ticket comprised of activist Arthur Reamer for president and August Gilhouse for vice president. The campaign largely focused on attacking the Socialist Party, accusing it of suppressing the vital revolutionary feature of socialism and also attacked the more left-wing factions not only in the IWW but in their own party accusing them of embracing anarchism. They ultimately received 0.19% of the popular vote. Despite the improved vote share, they were getting worse financial situations and it was forced to transition the people from a daily schedule to a weekly schedule. And in 1913, an internal party report concluded that the SLP was no longer a viable party. This led some members to propose a unity conference with the Socialist Party of America. Then in 1914, Daniel DeLeon died, and his hand-picked successor, 29-year-old Arnold Peterson, took over as national secretary and editor of the party newspaper. He quickly restructured the party's press and finances, saving it from bankruptcy and resolving its long-standing financial issues. And at their 1916 convention, Two people actively sought the party's nomination, 1912 candidate Arthur Reamer and party activist Caleb Harrison. Reamer won overwhelmingly, and Harrison was chosen to be his running mate. This ticket campaigned more aggressively than previous SLP candidates, and even more than the Socialist Party candidate Alan L. Benson, taking a very active tour across the country. During a campaign stop in Butte, Montana, Reamer was arrested for giving a speech on the streets without permission from city officials, and given a $10 fine that was later suspended, while Harrison was also arrested on a similar charge in Homestead, Pennsylvania. The party also distributed more than 1.5 million leaflets during the campaign promoting their ideology. They were only on the ballot in 17 states and ultimately received 0.09% of the popular vote. 1917 would end up becoming a very big year for socialists for two reasons. The first one we'll get into is the U.S.'s entry into World War I. Much like the Socialist Party, the SLP committed itself to opposing the war and published pamphlets calling for peace and organizing a number of demonstrations to protest the war. And also, much like the Socialist Party, they ended up becoming a target of the Sedition Act for doing so. Albeit in smaller quantities, you know, given the fact that they were a much smaller party and by extension, a smaller threat to Woodrow Wilson. 
though the SLP desperately tried to be a big threat by trying to align itself with the Socialist Party again, basically saying, okay, we'll join up with you, but you have to promise that De Leonism will become your main ideology. Surprisingly, that did not turn out as well as they hoped it would, and they remained two separate parties. Later that year, socialism gained even more street cred via the Russian Revolution. Given this new information, there was questions in regards to the Socialist Labor Party's position on this. The SLP's leadership were critical of the Russian Revolution, arguing that only a worldwide socialist revolution could bring socialism to a backwards country like Russia, Peterson's paraphrased words not mine, whereas others like Louis Friana and Daniel de Leon's son, Solon de Leon, supported the Bolsheviks wholeheartedly and felt that the SLP should join Lenin's new Communist International, or common term. Lenin himself even tried to reach out to the SLP, praising de Leon as the greatest of modern socialists the only one who has added anything to socialism thought since Marx, and that the industrial state as conceived by De Leon will ultimately have to be the form of government in Russia. While the SLP did send a delegate to the first meeting of the common term in Moscow, they quickly broke with the Bolsheviks due to their unwillingness to accept the Bolsheviks' demands, and never ended up joining the common term. Then they decided to expel the pro-Bolshevik members, like Friana and De Leon, who then decided to go join the Socialist Party and become its left-wing faction, before deciding to split off from them and forming a political party that will more than likely be getting its own video that will be just as long as this one. The SLP, in turn, immediately said that this new party was trash, and ultimately called them Burlesque Bolsheviks and they set forth with their own presidential nomination convention to try and still remain strong in a growingly left-wing America. Or at least, it was growing a decent left-wing at the time. Now, they wanted Arthur Reamer to run for their nomination. However, Reamer was part of that hashtag commie enter, so they decided that they would go ahead and nominate William Wesley Cox instead, and nominate August Gielhaus to be his running mate. Now there's actually one funny tidbit regarding this ticket. You see, the Democratic presidential nominee also happened to be named Cox, which actually led to a decent number of confusion between these two. So when William Cox decided that he was going to hold a campaign event, they would actually write in the papers, Mr. Cox of Ohio accorded praise because they thought he was James Cox. Ultimately, the smaller of the two Coxes got 0.12% of the vote, thus proving size does matter. By the early 1920s, the SLP's membership was <laughs> minuscule to say the least, and Arnold Peterson decided that the party needed to go in a brand new direction. They were going nowhere, so maybe it was time to finally make some sacrifices and actually join up with another like-minded group. So they sent some representatives to the Third Congress of the Comintern. But then they saw how the German Communist Party treated a smaller syndicalist party and ultimately decided, yeah, we should probably just stop trying to make friends. Hashtag relatable. Deciding that it was probably best just to remain focused on the SLP in and of itself. Hence, they didn't even consider joining La Follette's Progressive Coalition, instead going solo, by nominating Carpenter and perennial candidate Frank T. Johns for president, and perennial candidate Vern Reynolds as his running mate. That reinvigoration translated into their campaigning, apparently campaigning to the point of exhaustion. Their efforts only got them 0.1% of the popular vote, being beaten by the newly founded Communist Party, but the SLP didn't really care. What they did care about was the fact that these two were very good at spreading the SLP's message to people, so they decided, eh, screw it, for 1928, let's just rehash this ticket. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. As soon as the two were nominated, Johns decided to immediately hold some local campaign events in Bend, Oregon, before he would embark on the SLP's national campaign tour. After he finished one speech and was answering some questions that were posed to him by the audience, he noticed that there was a boy being swept away by the river he then proceeded to take off his coat and jump into the frigid river to try and save him. However, the cold water, the distance from the shore, the current, 
and John's tiring himself out due to the massive campaigning he did, ultimately it was just too much for him to bear, and him and the boy got swept away to their deaths. Of course, the SLP mourned the loss, but they still had to move forth with the presidential campaign, so they just promoted Reynolds to the top of the ticket and nominated activist Jeremiah D. Cowley as his running mate. They ended up receiving 0.06% of the vote, the first time that they were able to beat the other nothing party, the Prohibitionists. The Great Depression was really able to live up to its name, wasn't it? Because it was pretty great. Well, I mean, not for poor people, no, 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 no. But it was great for the three big leftist political parties in America. The Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and the Socialist Labor Party. Because these three were proven right about capitalism inevitably failing, and people flocked to them for a potential solution. While of course other people were able to rally up more support, inevitably the SLP did manage to get some people to at least pay attention to their ideas. In 1932, Vern Reynolds was chosen to be their forebearer to represent this ideology, and furniture finisher John W. Aiken was nominated to be his running mate. They ultimately ended up receiving 0.09% of the vote. Now, after that election happened, the other two major leftist parties decided that they were going to try cozying up to FDR, you know, try forming alliances with him and maybe see if they could try and influence their New Deal policies that way. However, the SLP decided they were going to take a different route and decided to immediately start attacking FDR, claiming that the New Deal policies were exactly what the fascists in Europe were doing, and of course saying, we're the only people who can truly stand up against this rise of fascism. The candidate that they chose to try and bring this issue to light in 1936 was John Aiken, and perennial New York candidate Emil Tetchert was nominated to be his running mate. They ultimately got 0.03% of the votes. Now as the depression went on, and the fact that the New Deal was going to be the only thing that was actually going to tackle the depression was made pretty abundantly clear, the left-wing parties had to move their criticism of Roosevelt in other fields, and it just so happened that World War II was starting to begin, and the SLP decided to hop on the anti-war train, outright calling a potential draft as an anti-democratic, hitleristic measure being crammed down the throats of the American people. And by 1940, they wanted to spread that message even further via a presidential nominee. I mean, how else are you going to do it? John Aiken was easily renominated, and perennial candidate Aaron M. Orange was nominated to be his running mate. They ultimately received 0.03% of the popular vote. Now, to give the SLP some credit where it's due, they were the only major left-wing party that actually remained consistent in regards to their views on the war. The Socialist Party was originally against it, but then after Pearl Harbor, they were for it. The Communist Party went from being for a war, to being against the war, to being for the war again. But the SLP remained strong in saying, no, we oppose World War II as they viewed it as a war that was being held by capitalist interests. However, they did hold some hope that this war could eventually lead into a worldwide socialist revolution that they have been so desperately crying for, and to show that all of the dissent against the war wasn't just, you know, Nazi sympathizers, they had to nominate a presidential candidate to show that they were still lefties who opposed the war. They nominated Edward Teichert, who was the younger brother of Emil Teichert for president, and they nominated party delegate Arla Arba as his running mate. Another slight advantage that this election gave was that this was during a brief period of time that the Communist Party was not a political party, but rather a non-electoral political organization, so technically the far-left vote was quote-unquote dominated by the SLP, which helped them triple their vote count to 0.09% of the vote. After the war ended, the SLP was pretty happy, but not exactly for the reasons that everyone else seemed to be happy. You see, most people were happy that fascism was crushed and that the soldiers could return home. The SLP was of course happy for those reasons, but they were also happy because they saw the immediate aftermath of the war as a sign that the collapse of capitalism was intimate 
And when capitalism falls, what will take its place? Fascism couldn't. It was already destroyed. Hence, the SLP would rise to power. However, while they were thinking about that alternate reality, the US had decided to shift its crosshairs from the right to the left, and it now started to do a cold war with the Soviet Union. But before going after big boy commies, they decided to be the schoolyard bullies to lefties in their backyard, and the Red Scare and communist smears began. And depending on the left-wing political group's views on communism, depended on how rampant the smears were. For example, Norman Thomas? They couldn't really necessarily go to him and accuse him of being a communist, because he had been fiercely critical of communism throughout his entire political career. Meanwhile, another left-wing political group in the United States had a literal direct line to Stalin, so... They can't necessarily avoid it. But what about the SLP? The SLP has sort of ridden the middle ground between the two groups. So some party members, led by Orange and Emil, proposed that the SLP officially publish parts of their platform criticizing Stalin. You know, just in case. But Peterson was like, nah. Now that one word, actually led to the SLP's outdoor rallies to officially end because their party members would be physically and verbally harassed because they were supposedly evil communists working with Stalin. The SLP, like many other leftist groups, remain undeterred and pressed forth with re-establishing itself as the main left-wing voice in America. Which was hard to do considering Henry Wallace entered the scene and pretty much dominated the left-wing vote and Norman Thomas got scraps of it, but nothing has stopped the SLP before, what's stopping them now? So they went ahead and nominated Ed Tishert for president, and subway dispatcher Stephen Emery as his running mate. An interesting tidbit that happened during the election was that in Tishert's home state of Pennsylvania, he had to run under the banner of the Industrial Government Party, as ballot access rules prevented two parties from having the same word in their names, you know, in order to prevent confusion. They managed to get 0.06% of the popular vote. After all those issues, the SLP was kind of lost in regards to how they will move forward, particularly in regards to their presidential ambitions. Not entirely because they didn't have anybody that wanted to run, but because they had to follow the Constitution's rules and nominate 35 year old natural born citizens. The two SLP activists they wanted to run, John Quinn and Joseph Princeton, could not run due to the fact that they were immigrants. The person they ended up choosing as their nominee was the editor of The People, Eric Haas, and Stephen Emery was nominated again to be the running mate. In order to juggle his editorial duties, he mostly campaigned on the weekends, though to make up for it, he would campaign harder using his editorial and writing to his advantages in press conferences and interviews, he ended up getting 0.05% of the votes, which the SLP loved a lot. And I might say, what? Why? Because they had finally beaten the Socialist Party. That accomplishment immediately put Eric Haas in S tier of their candidates, which just made the SLP decide to stick with Haas, easily renominating him for the 1956 rematch election. They also nominated Georgia Kozini as his running mate. This time, they changed up their campaign strategy, choosing to begin the campaign on Labor Day and have Haas and his running mate conduct two individual campaign tours from opposite ends of the country, eventually meeting in the middle. They even had a decent access to graphic designers due to the fact that they had a newspaper. They ended up receiving 0.07% of the votes. For 1960, there really wasn't anything new to talk about. They renominated their old ticket, they repeated the same strategy, usually having local party affiliates that were dying organize the events to get some reinvigoration from a national candidate showing up. Right before the elections, they held the largest rallies of the cycle in New York and California respectively. They ended up again receiving 0.07% of the vote. In 1964, they decided to change things up a bit by replacing Kozini with perennial Massachusetts candidate Henning A. Blowman as his running mate. There really wasn't any room for third parties in this election, so the SLP got completely sidelined, even more than usual. They ended up getting 0.06% of the vote, 
which was technically their first third place showing. After Haas's last presidential run, he wrote a letter that spelled grim details for the SLP. He simply pointed out the fact that the SLP's membership was rapidly aging and they weren't really making any gains with the left. Due to the fact that all of these new left type figures were going to groups such as the Socialist Workers Party because they actually participated in civil rights demonstrations as such, while the SLP openly called these demonstrations diversions from the socialist movement and outright forbade their party members from participating in them or even just attending them to pass out their own flyers. By 1967, many party factions were growing tired of Peterson's iron fist holding the party back and the Palo Alto affiliate of the SLP submitted a resolution trying to make the party more democratic, which Peterson responded with by saying, Hey, didn't you guys participate in a Vietnam War protest even though I explicitly told you you shouldn't do it? BE GONE, fuck! Despite these troubles, the SLP leadership moved forth with their presidential ambitions, nominating Henning Blumen for president and perennial Pennsylvania candidate George S. Taylor as his running mate, they ended up receiving 0.07% of the vote. However, there were still marital problems in the SLP by 1969. In New York, a pro Haas group in the SLP started rallying up support against Peterson's role within the party, some choosing to leave, and some choosing to stay and fight him. Eventually, Haas himself left the party in protest of Peterson's power. Though eventually, opposition to Peterson grew to the point that Peterson had absolutely no choice but to resign that year and Nathan Karp became the new chairman of the party. Those splits were not exactly looking good for the SLP. It had shrunk the party way faster than the usual decline they were facing, but by 1972, things had officially quieted down. Loyalists stayed loyal, defectors had mostly checked out of politics, and the dissenters saw the defectors fade away and tried to stay in the party to fix it. Another thing they had to fix was the people, because now that Haas was gone, the quality of the paper drastically went down. Maybe a good old presidential election can fix the party's woes. The party moved forth and nominated perennial Illinois candidate Louis Fisher for president and party activist Genevieve Gunderson as his running mate. They ultimately got 0.07% of the vote. But by 1976, the heads of the party were starting to realize their strategy up to this point wasn't really working. 100 years and nothing had ultimately been done. So they started to change things up in the party, moving their conventions to be held once a year and reform the party process to be more democratic. To show the party had changed, they decided to move forth with a new presidential nominee to be the face of this new change, nominating perennial candidate Jules Levin and the wife of their 1968 candidate, Constance Blumen, as his running mate. They ultimately got 9,594 votes. As the decade was about to change, the SLP started rethinking their strategy and priorities. Seeing financial hindrances, they chose to forego future presidential runs altogether and focus promoting their ideology via down the ballot races as well as their tried and true newspaper, The People. This winding down of their presidential ambitions got the attention of, you know, socialist parties that did focus on presidential elections, most prominently the Socialist Workers Party who decided to start getting all friendly to Karp and other SLP heads. However, soon afterwards the Socialist Labor Party immediately started publishing anti-Socialist Workers Party stuff in the Weekly People, and the SWP responded by publishing anti-SLP stuff in their paper The Militant. For all the changes the SLP has made, one thing is tried and true. They really don't like making friends. By 1980, it was really clear that membership was just steadily going down, and the party heads decided to propose disbanding the party altogether in order to focus on a working class revolution. But as the party now had enough people to oppose leadership, they decided, screw you leaders, we'll do what we want. We want to keep this party stick around for a little longer. However, some state affiliates didn't really see that, such as the Minnesota party deciding to officially leave the national party and rebrand itself to the new union party. Around this time, a decent amount of the old guard decided to leave the party as well, 
which they used as an opportunity to rebrand themselves as more of an advocacy group. You know, we'll organize left-wing candidates, join you in rallies, and help unions and blah blah blah. They thought that this would lead to a mass influx of members that would try and help the Socialist Labor Party get off the ground to maybe try running national candidates again. However, just looking at the membership numbers as well as the party's bank account made people realize, yeah, this isn't going to end well. Eventually getting to the point where Jules Levin's 1985 New Jersey gubernatorial bid was the last time somebody ran for political office under the banner Socialist Labor Party. Not that long afterwards, the people was moved from a weekly schedule to a monthly schedule, and the SLP kinda just started to f naturally fade into the background of the left-wing political movement in America while other left-wing political movements started picking up steam. However, despite the fact that year after year, membership and funds were drying up drastically, they had still managed to publish the people on a monthly schedule up to 2004, when they officially moved it into a bi-monthly schedule. Three years later, in 2007, it was reported that the SLP had only 77 members nationwide, and at their monthly meetings, they had like three to six members show up at a time. Eventually, in 2008, the people had officially ceased publication and the SLP officially closed its doors. There was a brief attempt to revive the people as an online publication, but it ended up shutting down 100% in 2011. And with that, we have concluded the story of the first left-wing political party in the United States of America. Hopefully, we can take this story and... use it for something. Even if it is, just for like nerdy tidbits. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.